Somebody who uh, watched a couple of my videos about uh, fighter types asked me to explain what line touch was, how you did it, and some of the strategies that you might use to set yourself up for a little greater potential for success. <clears throat> And I thought about it, and by golly, I had a hard time figuring out how to show somebody on a video that would do the job of actually conveying the information accurately to them. So this is my attempt. <laughs> uh, I've got two, these are actually pieces of bamboo that I split, and I colored one dark and the other one's new natural. And I'm going to pretend, <clears throat> I'd like you to pretend, <laughs> that there are kites at the end of these lines. And we'll call these lines rather than bamboo sticks. Now, in line touch, it's exactly, the, the title is exactly what it is. It's about touching your opponent's flying line with your flying line. Now, originally, this began in uh, the United States as an alternative to cutting line and cutting uh, fighter kites out of the sky, which is uh, done all over the world. <clears throat> but in North America, that uh, seemed quite harmful and potentially very dangerous because the line that's used to cut the kites out of the sky, the reason they can cut them is because those lines are coated with powdered glass. And powdered glass is very uh, dangerous uh, in your hands or if someone were to accidentally get in contact with it or an animal, uh, it's quite hazardous. Now, the person who thought of the idea of this alternative wanted a safer, but just as much fun or maybe more fun activity to replace it. And so line touch is what they ended up with. And here's basically what it does. You have two, fly you have two flyers. I'm going to use these markers in hopes that it'll help convey the idea. Let's say the wind direction is here. Now I'm going to fly in a line touch competition on this beach right here. We'll call this a beach. <laughs> now line touch is a head-to-head -head competition a one-on-one -on -one competition. It's very similar to singles tennis or to playing checkers or chess. I mean, there are two people who are participating. Now, the wind direction is really critical because in a fighter kite, the angle the kite flies to the wind has an awful lot to do with how the kite behaves. And if you have the wind direction clearly in your mind, really know where it is, and each opponent, let's say that my opponent is here. He's standing here. I will be standing in exactly the same relationship to the wind, but I'll be over here. The important thing here is that when you put a line between the two flyers, that each flyer has their back directly into the wind. The wind is blowing on their back. So the wind is blowing against my back and the wind is blowing against my opponent's back. 
and that our position to each other is perpendicular to the wind direction. And we're about 20 feet apart, plus or minus, but roughly 20 feet between here and here. It could be any distance. I'm just using that as a uh, distance that often is used because it seems practical. And I'll explain that in a second. So here I am here. I'm going to use the dark colored line on my kite. And my opponent's going to use the light colored line. Now, the object of this game, first of all, the start of the game is important. Uh, when each flyer has the, their kite in the air flying before the beginning of the match or the point or the game, however you want to describe it, uh, they're both flying back and forth and around and sort of in front of themselves, primarily. When one of them, or if this is a really uh, more, I guess you'd say serious <laughs> uh, competition where there's actually a judge and maybe even a, a prize or something for somebody who actually wins, but Normally, it's just me and a kite flying buddy at the beach here, and we're just flying for fun. We love it. <laughs> it is fun. So we're flying like this. We haven't started yet. Now, one of us is going to decide when to start the game and it alternates. Let's say that I'm the person now who has the option of starting the game. What I do is I ask my opponent, are you ready? And if my opponent says yes, and then I'll say I am ready also, or I'm not ready. And until both are ready, the game won't start. And by ready, what I mean, I don't know what my opponent means by that, <laughs> but I know what I mean. And what I mean is that my kite is flying the way I want it to fly. It's predictable. I understand that it was the kite that I selected for this particular speed of wind that we have, whatever that is, and it's flying well. And I'm confident that I know how to control it. So we're both ready. I'm the one in this point that is designated to start. So I will say one of two words, and it's my choice, either top or bottom. Now, if I say bottom, what that means is we, at, on this particular point, on this particular part of the game, this one point, every, every uh, match has one or more points to it, like many games do. And so each time you compete, you compete for one point. So I will say bottom in this instance, and what that means is the point will be earned when the first flyer can maneuver their line so that the, their line comes in contact with the opponent's line from underneath the opponent's line, like this. This has to occur before one of them has their, guy, their kite hit the ground. If one of the opponent's kites hits the ground, that person loses that point. So number one, your back is to the wind, 
And number two, you're confident about your kite being controllable. Now, if I were to have said top as my starting word, I would have then been anticipating that my opponent's going to come across and want to put their line on top of my line to earn the point, or I would do that to them. Whoever does that first wins that point. Now, there are very few rules in this game, but one of the rules, and it's a important one, is that once the flyers have established their position and have the alignment with the wind equal, they cannot move, except in a very small area around that point. And the reason is that they could gain an advantage by moving in a specific direction in uh, the attempt to win a particular point. That would be unfair because <laughs> the object is to use your kite and your kite line that you maneuver, not your feet. So that is one element that's really important. And so that, that is, so when the point is started, then the flyers are each trying to accomplish the same thing at the same time. And that's what makes the challenge very interesting and requires that the kites are quite quick to maneuver and that you have some pretty much uh, high confidence that you can control it the way you want it. Now, when the kites are like in the downwind area here, in this general area where the wind is pretty strong, the kites behave really well and they're easier to control. But when the kite is out, like if I were over here, my kite would be very, very difficult to control because there would not be very much wind with my kite at this angle. So my kite is no longer facing the wind like it would be here. It's now at a very steep angle to the wind, like about like here. So my kite functions like it doesn't have very much wind, which means I have to change how I manipulate the flying line in order to get the kite to accomplish what I want it to do. Now, being over here close to my opponent, in fact, right at his hands or her hands, for example, is a winning position sometimes, but only when you have control of the kite. And one of the things that's really important in addition to the positioning of the flyers being right and the limitation of foot movement is maintained, then one other thing that I always try to do before I say I'm ready is to make sure that my flying line is long enough so that I can actually reach a little bit beyond my opponent not a long ways, but some. I want to be able to go behind my opponent if I have the opportunity to do that. It's not easy to do that, but sometimes you have the opportunity based on how strong the wind is or how mild the wind is. And I want that, I want to know in the beginning that I have enough flying line length to reach beyond my opponent. Now, this process goes on repeatedly until the two flyers have agreed they've flown enough to make a match. And that can be, often it's two points out of three or three out of five, five out of seven, something in that range is pretty typical for a match. And once a match is completed, 
if there are other people who want to fly, well, then they get up and they fly and you rotate or you set up multiple places to fly and fly at the same time uh, with your partner. Now that's fundamentally what line touch is all about. But what happened when it began was that the kites that were used were the kites that were traditionally used for fighter kites and still are traditionally used for fighter kites all over the world that are made from bamboo and paper. And those kites were really the only fighter kites at the time. And they work well, except for certain circumstances. One of them was dampness. <laughs> if you're at the beach, like we are here, we're at this beach here, and let's say the sand is wet, and I have a paper and bamboo kite, my kite goes down on the sand. Well, it's going to get wet. And when paper, tissue paper, uh, or thin paper, gets wet, it turns to mush. Becomes no more use to me as a kite. So when that started to show up, then new materials began to be used for making kites, materials that were waterproof and had other properties that the flyer thought might give them an edge in performance. Now, the edge in performance is something that the kite can provide. And in line touch, there is no limitation, no rule limiting the kite size, the kite shape, or anything about the kite other than it is a fighter kite. That's it. So it gave the flyers the opportunity to make their own kites and design their own kites and experiment with how much of a performance edge they could get and win more. So that's what happened. Just like many things in America, that's what happened. So that is how the North American fighter kites evolved. And that's why they evolved. And one of the factors, one of the main factors, was that in this line touch game, like I was saying, we're standing, say, 20, 25 feet apart here. The amount of flying line required for me to reach beyond my opponent is less than 50 feet. So when I'm flying with a flying line that's, say, 50 to 60 feet long or shorter, my kite is going to fly faster. It has less drag because it has less line to drag through the wind. And it will fly much faster. And speed became a very important quality in kite design. It didn't overpower the need to have the kite totally reliably maneuverable. That's still number one. But boy, a close second is speed. And balancing those two things in the kite designs are what most kite makers and kite flyers did in order to accomplish this goal for winning at line touch. Now, as line touch became flown and uh, played more, people began to think, well, what if I didn't want to play an aerial combat game like line touch? Well, they developed other games that were not combat style, totally different. One of them, and, well, several of the games that they developed following line touch were games that you could play by yourself. You don't need a, an opponent to fly, to fly with in order to do it. One of them is this. This is really simple. This is a, let's just say this is a pole 
or a stick that you jammed into the sand at our beach here, or you had some mechanism to hold it vertically. The height of this could be any height. It could be two feet. It could be six, eight feet tall. Doesn't really matter. And it's placed downwind. Not necessarily directly downwind, but downwind, whatever distance you want it to be. And on top of that stick, you put a plastic cup. Sort of like that. A little funky there, but I know, but what the heck. <laughs> and the object of this game is for the flyer to bring his flying line to the pole and up and tip the cup off the pole. Now, when that pole is six feet high and it's only 50 feet away from you, that's something you could accomplish. But if this is 50 feet away and it's only three feet high, that's a different story. That's very challenging to accomplish. And in competitions of this type of a game, they put several of these poles at various heights and at different angles to the wind and different distances from the flyer. And they give the flyer a specific amount of time. Each flyer is given the same amount of time. Let's say it's three minutes. And in that three minutes, how many cups can they knock off the sticks? One with the most wins, simple. This is something you can practice on your own, any place. You could have a stick, put it in a parking lot, do it in a park, do it on the beach, anywhere. And it really is fun to do because it's a little more challenging than it appears. Well, like many things in life, you know, and uh, that challenge is what draws me to these various aerial games, is that they are challenging, and they do take an enormous amount of focus and attention on the flyer's part in order to uh, have even a chance of... Uh, being competitive. Well, I hope this gives you a little bit of a overview of a couple of the games that are often played with North American fighter kites and that you will try them yourself and become as addicted to them <laughs> as I am.